Praise God and I want to thank you, thank Sister Victoria for uh, leading us in worship and I want to thank you for worshipping with us and uh, again I want to take the opportunity to thank every pastor uh, that has um, promoted this stream, every youth leader, every young person and I also want to especially thank Pastor Harvey, uh, Sister Harvey for allowing us to utilise uh, the Pentecost of Sydney facilities, uh, this wonderful church for tonight's stream. I uh, must say it was glad, it was awesome to come tonight. It had been a while since I'd been here um, and it felt great to walk into the house of God, even though there's nobody here in front of us. Amen. Well, as mentioned, it's a special day today. It's Good Friday uh, where we celebrate the crucifixion of Jesus. And um, I have a couple of portions of scripture uh, that I'd like you to turn to with me. Uh, the first one is in John chapter 19. We're going to read verse 28 through to verse 30. John chapter 19, verse 28 through to verse 30. After that well-known portion of text in John chapter 15, verse 13. John chapter 15, verse 13. Amen. We're going to read from John 19 to begin with. Bible says from verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head, he gave up his spirit. John chapter 15, verse 13 Wonderful portion of text that we love. The Bible says, Greater love has no man than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Well, I want to speak to you tonight on uh, this thought, um, which I've simply called, He died for the worst in me. I don't know about you, but I am grateful that he just didn't die for the best version of myself. He didn't die for the polished version. He died for all of me. The mess, the dysfunction, everything. He died for that. And so we're going to pray right now for, uh, that God would bless the ministry of his word. And again, I want to thank you for joining with us tonight and want to encourage you to share the stream and engage. Let's get the word of God out there to all the young people in Australia, throughout the world on this Friday night. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for your presence that we feel. We're grateful, Lord Jesus, for, the, for your word, which is available to us. And we pray right now that you'd anoint that word as it's, as it's preached, as it's brought forward, that you'd allow the word to find good soil in the heart of every worshiper, every hearer, Lord God, every person joining this stream. I pray that you would minister to them through that screen, through that device, Lord God. I ask that you'd anoint my lips, Lord. Give me a word to speak, Lord God. Shape my thoughts that, it would be, that they would be effective in touching and ministering the lives of young people around this nation. We never fail to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all of the praise. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. 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 Praise God. He died for the worst in me. Well, history places extreme honor and prestige on those that have gone before us and given their life for a greater cause. Honouring people who have demonstrated the ultimate courage and bravery, the most selfless of acts, is something that almost every nation takes seriously. Honouring fallen soldiers is so much a part of national culture that it's built into our calendars. In Australia, on the 25th of April of every year, the whole nation stops, whatever they're doing, for a minute's silence in honour of the Anzacs. For 105 years, the nation has honoured our fallen heroes for the ultimate sacrifice they made for our freedom, which we enjoy today. And regardless of your politics and regardless of your views on war tonight, I believe that the honour and the esteem that we have for these soldiers should never end because in their decision to place their life on the line, they afforded us as a nation the ultimate freedom that we enjoy. Even as we find ourselves isolated and in our homes and having to adjust to life away from uh, public gatherings, it does not compare in any way to the sacrifice of life that generations before us gave for this country. 
Now, because of the size of the sacrifice they gave, our country stands to attention as we contemplate and honor those fallen soldiers. And these soldiers fought and died for a nation that they loved, for the freedom they and their families enjoy. Now, we read accounts of soldiers And we've heard of accounts of soldiers who would explain that they chose to go to war for their families and their loved ones. Their bravery and courage knew no limits, but they did it for a nation and for people that they loved and felt compelled to protect. And we still honor them for this today, and I'm grateful for that. Now, while it is difficult to find words that adequately describe their bravery and selflessness, The reality is that their their choice to fight for a country that they loved and for people that they loved is consistent with normal human behavior. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, here's what I mean. I myself, I'm not inclined to willingly give up my life. I want to (laughs) live. I've got a lot to live for, my family. But If I believed it was necessary for me to lose my life in order to save my wife and my children, then I would be willing to do that. As a general rule, as a people, we want to live, we want to be alive, but when it comes to the people we love and people that love us in return, it is natural that we would be willing to give our life for them. What am I saying to you here today? I'm saying to you that this, it's for this reason, amen, that what Jesus did at Calvary is the single greatest example of sacrificial love the world has ever known. Why? Because he did not just die for believers. He did not just die for his worshippers that loved and adored him. He did not just die for apostolics who believed and worshipped and served him. No, he died for all of humanity. He died for those that mocked him and spat upon him. He died for the unbelievers. He died for every man and every woman. He died for every soul that would ever draw breath in this world. And let me make it relevant for you here tonight. I know that you might be a believer and praise God, but but he did not just die for the best version of you. He did not just die for the polished version of you that looks good and talks right. He died for every single part of you, the dysfunction. He died for the mess. He died He died for the sin. He died for 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 every part of your life. He did not just die for the good. He died for the bad. He didn't just die for you on your best day. No, he died for you on your worst day. Amen. Why is this important, young people? It's important because we constantly disqualify ourselves. We believe that we are unworthy. We believe that when we fall short of the glory of God, the blood of Christ does not cover us. And I'm not giving you a license to sin here tonight. But I'm here to preach the truth of God's word, that Jesus doesn't only love you when you're at your best. He loves you just the same in the deepest valley of your life. He loves you just the same when all you feel is discouragement all around you. He loves you just the same when you feel a million miles from God because he doesn't love the best version of you. He loves all of you, all of the mess, everything that you are. That's what he died for here. And I believe I've got a word for a young person watching this stream here tonight. Night. You might feel beaten. You might feel broken. You might feel down and out. You might feel let go. But God has not turned his back on you. His blood still reaches out to every single part of your life. Praise the name of the Lord. See, even the best of us are failures. Leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, we read of the betrayal of Peter. It was told to Peter that he would betray Jesus, yet Peter could not believe what he had heard. He could not believe it was within him to betray his master. When Peter was under pressure and his relationship with Jesus threatened his well-being, he flipped and denied even knowing Jesus. The story of Peter denying Jesus three times serves as a powerful reminder of the frailty of even us as believers. Peter, the great man who was recorded to preach the first Pentecostal sermon in Acts 2. Peter, the great man who showed boldness, who, who, 
who walked on water when nobody would, would walk on water. Peter, the guy that would, that would show crazy faith and confess Jesus as the Christ in Matthew 16. The great Peter had an impressive resume in the kingdom of God. He did things that few would do. He said things that few would say. He understood things that few understood. Yet somehow we are to comprehend that this very same man could not even conjure up the guts and the courage to simply admit he knew who Jesus was. Amen. See, he had faith to walk on water, but lacked the courage to confess even the knowledge of Jesus. You see, saints of God, even Peter's loyalty to Jesus had limitations. If you apply enough pressure to any man or woman, eventually you'll see cracks in their loyalty. You apply enough heat on somebody, eventually they will abandon what is right. None of us are perfect, you see. We all have a breaking point, a fault line, where we reach the limit of our love and our loyalty. And under the right circumstances, if an offense is big enough, if the temptation is large enough, if the hurt is raw enough, we have it within us to turn our back on what we know is right. We have the capacity to love. We have the capacity to be loyal. We have the capacity to have relationship with others and with God. We have the ability to be good Christians, to be faithful and to live right. We know how to do it. We know what it looks like, but we are flawed people. We will fail. We will fall short of the glory of God. And I'm simply here to remind you that when you do fall short of the glory of God, God died for that version of yourself. He will not turn his back on you simply when you fail. No, he didn't just die for the best version of you. No, he died for every Every single version of you, amen. Even the mess, the dysfunction, that's the thing that he died for, praise God. You see, we all have all fallen short of the glory of God. We all make mistakes, but I thank God that his word declares that he loves me with an everlasting love, that my Jesus does not have the ability to stop loving me. Even if he tried, he cannot stop because he is a lover of my soul. I'd stop right now and remind some young person wrestling with this thought that God does not love you because you're good. God doesn't love you because you're talented, because you behave yourself. No, God loves us even despite ourself. Amen. When I'm good, my Jesus loves me. When I'm bad, my Jesus loves me. On my best day, when everything's going right, he loves me. But on my worst day, when nothing's going right and I'm making mistakes, he still loves me just the same. And you ought to be grateful for that, that he will not drop you when you've made a mistake. He won't abandon you when you've made a mistake because he died for every single part of you. Praise God. The Bible says that but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Amen. That ought to excite you. That you don't have to be perfect to receive the love and the grace of God. Because his grace is the unmerited and unearned favor of God. And because you did nothing to earn it, there is nothing that you can do to unearn the grace and the favor and, and the mercy of God. That ought to excite you. You ought to be grateful for that. That I don't have to be perfect to receive the love of God, but he takes me as I am and he loves me and his blood still reaches every part, every single part of my life. Can somebody say amen? amen? Praise God. See, God's love for us is not only perfect, it's actually a very unique love. One of the reasons I believe that we struggle with accepting his love is because it's a unique love. It's unlike any other love. Because it's unusual for someone to keep loving us even when we abuse that love. It's unusual when we reject somebody that they don't reject us back. Usually when we betray someone, they will betray us. Usually when we ignore somebody, they will ignore us back. But no, not our Savior. He is different because He loves us as a Savior, but He knows us as a friend. We interact with Jesus in a unique way. He is our authority. He is in charge, but He is also our closest friend. He is with us always. Amen. You see, we only understand love in two forms. There is vertical love. The love that I have, for example, as a parent to my child is vertical love. 
I love my children dearly, but my love for them comes from the place of parental authority. I correct them and I teach them and I set an example for them. My love for them is shown through the lens of authority, not authority that is abused to their detriment, no, but authority that is required for my children's development. We also have horizontal love. The love, for example, I would have for my brothers and sisters in Christ. The love I have for my friends is horizontal love. I demonstrate my love for them in the care I have for them. The support I show them. A shoulder I give for them to cry on. I love them not from a place of authority, but I love them as a friend. And so we understand this concept because we have vertical relationships in our life with our parents, with our pastor, with our children, but we also have horizontal relationships with our brothers and our sisters in Christ, with our siblings, amen, and with our cousins, for example. Praise God. But then how do we process God's love for us? How do we define the relationship that he has with us as his children? What do we do when the Bible describes him as a king of kings and lord of lords, but also calls him a friend of sinners? How do we process that as believers? How do we define him when the Bible declares him king of glory, but also a man made of no reputation? You see, we understand that kings have ultimate authority. A king is defined as a male figure who rules a defined state, nation, or territory. Kings have ultimate authority. They rule what's called an autocracy, a system of government where one person has absolute authority and history is filled with autocracies that have failed because there is no perfect man. And when an imperfect person is given ultimate power, corruption takes over and destroys their kingdom. A corrupt king only serves himself. A corrupt king destroys his own people. A corrupt king ruins his own nation, but I'm here to simply tell you that the kingdom of God that we live in can never be destroyed. Why? Because it's not ruled by a corrupt or an imperfect king. It's ruled by a, it's ruled by a perfect king because you are the kingdom of God. And the Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why? Because the gatekeeper of our kingdom is a perfect king. Amen. You might be in this world, but the Bible says you're not of this world. We're we're just passing on through. When you repented and were baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, you entered another kingdom. And I'm here to tell you that that kingdom is ruled by a king who is perfect, who is a perfect king, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. That ought to excite you that you're part of a kingdom and the ruler of that kingdom cannot be corrupted. He is a perfect king. He is a perfect leader. He has all authority. The Bible says heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. Amen. Our king does never abuse power but he holds all power he doesn't seek after glory he is the king of glory that's who our king is our king has authority to heal our king has authority to save our king has authority to forgive sinners there is no love no authority like that of Jesus Christ because he is a perfect king here tonight praise God you see, our king doesn't motivate his people out of fear. Our king motivates his people out of love. That's why we don't serve him just to stay out of hell. No, we serve him because he first loved us. Let me say that again, young people. We don't serve Jesus Christ. We don't live for Jesus Christ. We don't pray and read our Bible because we're scared of hell. No, that's not the motivation. We do it because we love him. We do it out of honor for him. We do it because he first reached out and grabbed us out of our mess. We do it because he dug us out of our ditch. Amen. I don't know about you, but if it weren't for Jesus tonight, I'd be sitting on a bar stool somewhere. But thanks be to God, he drew me and he drew you because he is a perfect king here tonight. Are you grateful that he is a perfect king and he drew you out of your life of dysfunction? Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now only a king has that type of authority. 
So Jesus presents himself to his people as a king of kings and lord of lords, as a God of ultimate authority and power. But you see, no ordinary keys, no ordinary king. An ordinary king does not dwell with common people. An ordinary king could never relate to the issues his people face. An ordinary king would never step down from his throne and spend time among his people because our king is no ordinary king. Our God presents as the king of glory, but also as a friend of sinners. You heard right, he's a friend. A friend is nothing like a king. A friend is the opposite of a king. Dictionary says a friend shares kindness and sympathy and empathy, compassion and common interest. That sounds nothing like a king, but we cannot deny it. The word of God describes Jesus in these ways. The word says, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hebrews 4, 15, for we are not a high priest which cannot be touched for the, with the feelings of our infirmities. And finally, John 15, greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. I mean, I thank God for these verses that remind me he's not a big, bad, scary God. No, he's a personal savior. He cares about my life and he cares about your life. He doesn't reject you because of your brokenness. Matter of fact, he is drawn to your brokenness. Some of us feel, amen, that we have to hide the worst parts of ourselves. No, God God is drawn to every piece of brokenness and every piece of dysfunction. He's drawn to that part of us because he wants to mend us and bring us and put us back together because he is our friend. Our God created the universe. He holds all power. But at the same time, if you were the only person left on earth worth dying for that remained, he would still die. If you were the only one remaining, praise God, he has compassion for you. Our Savior feels what you feel. He weeps when you weep. He rejoices when you rejoice. He mourns when you mourn. He celebrates with you when you celebrate. Why? Because he's not just a king. He is a friend. He's not just a ruler. He is our friend tonight praise God this is why Jesus is matchless this is why there is none like him because he has the authority of a creator the authority of a king and the compassion of a friend praise God but how can it be that one person can be both of those things how can a king go about showing himself to be a friend at the same time? How can a king show himself to be a friend without releasing and relinquishing his authority? Well, the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 to 10, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in in earth and things under the earth. Praise God. You see, he took the form of a servant, but he never lost his authority. He humbled himself, but still held all power. He was obedient unto death, but every knee still bowed. That ought to make you rejoice. That ought to make you stand to your feet, even in your living rooms. Praise God. That as a friend, he can feel my pain. He can feel my sadness. He can feel me when I'm discouraged. Amen. But as a king, he can defeat my enemies. As a friend, he will weep with me but as a king he gives me victory as a friend he feels my brokenness but as a king he puts me back together as a friend he understands temptation and sin but as a king he has the power to deliver you from all temptation and from all sin praise God and to demonstrate to you that he has all authority as king but all compassion as a friend our God our king our ruler our savior he died on a cross for you, for all of you, for the mess inside of you, for the sin inside of you, that we might have a way out and a life of freedom, praise God. That's what we celebrate today. That's what we're celebrating on Good Friday. It's the crucifixion of our Savior, the ultimate sacrifice, where he laid down his life, not just for those that love him, not just for those that are perfect. No, he laid it down for all of humanity, 
for every sinner, for every person that rejects him, for everyone that mocks him and, and abuses his love. No, he died for everyone. And young person, hear me right now. You might make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Don't walk away from the presence of God because he is a friend. You can walk straight back into the presence of God. When you fall short of the glory of God, the devil wants you to walk away from his presence. But no, you walk straight back. You march straight back into the presence of God because he's not just my king. He is my friend that understands what we go through. Praise the name of the Lord. So why is this word relevant to some young people here tonight? You hear a similar sermon every Good Friday. Hear about the resurrection every Easter Sunday. But why is this word relevant for you, young people, or for all people listening to I'll tell you why. Because I believe we all wrestle with this. Wrestle with the acceptance of God's unending love. When we sin and fall short of the glory of God, we think sometimes of our God as our king, as a principle that we're going to run away from. Fixing to expel us out of school. We view him as a principal that would be walking to our classroom, calling us out and kicking us out of school. But instead, sometimes we think of God is that we think of God as expelling us out of the kingdom of God and rejecting us and writing us off. But I'm here to tell you that is a lie from the devil. Because while Jesus holds all authority and power and dominion on earth, he can hold it while he loves you like the closest friend you've ever known. That is why young people please hear me now when you fail and we will fail we don't run away from him like he's a principal no we run directly into the presence of God because he has compassion for you he is a friend who cares for you and for me young people you might be struggling you might feel full of shame but don't run away from God don't run away from God's presence and sometimes when we fall enough times we just feel like we're not worthy. I'm just going to get out of this and hide myself from God. But no, that's not what the Lord wants. He's not shocked when you fall. He's not surprised when you sin. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows you're already going to do it. But what we ought to do as apostolic young people is pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and square our shoulders and march straight back into the loving arms of our Savior. Why? Because He loves you and He died for every single part of you, the good and the bad. Praise God. Today, as we stop to reflect on the life he laid down for all of mankind, remind yourself that he died for all of you. He died for the best and he died for the worst. We don't use this as an excuse to sin freely. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying. We don't abuse his grace. We don't deliberately sin because we know he's a God of mercy. No, we do not do that. But we respond to his grace and mercy by trying to please him in every area of our life. Amen. We don't live right to stay out of hell. We live right in honor of his greatness and his sacrifice that he made for us at Calvary. Jesus dying for the world is the greatest love story that has ever been told. The Bible says, as we read earlier, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Praise God. And I'm going to close with this. Young person, I want you to look into that screen and I want you to hear these words. Some of you are wrestling with your actions. You know that you're falling short of the glory of God. Some of you have struggled with this isolation and all of this time at home and it's had an impact on your relationship with God and some of us are carrying shame and guilt because of what we've done and the enemy is trying to sow thoughts into your mind, into your spirit to give up because you're unable to do it, to walk away because you've failed too many times. You, you've promised God and failed him, you may as well walk away. We're going to call that lie out because it's a lie from the pits of hell, from, from Satan himself but right now we're going to march back into the presence of God, amen, because we can wake up tomorrow morning and his mercies are new right there in the morning. We're going to pray right now as a nation, as a body of young people, that though I might fall, I'm going to rise and continue to worship my Savior because he did not just die for me on my best behavior. He died for even the worst parts of me. So I want to ask right now, 
wherever you are, that you would join me in prayer as I pray for you, as we pray for our, our youth groups, as we pray for our young people, as we pray for all of the brothers and sisters in Christ, as we pray for our churches and as we pray for our pastors. Join with me right now. Father, we love you. We are so grateful for what we feel in this place. We are so grateful that you allowed yourself, you lowered yourself, you humbled yourself, you allowed yourself to be hung on a cross and you shed blood for the remission of our sins and you allowed yourself to be buried and you rose again but you did it Lord God not just for our best not just for when we're on our best behavior Lord but you did it for every single part of us for the dirtiest and most ugly sin that's inside of us Lord God you died for every single part of us and we right now we are grateful for that we thank you for it we worship you Lord God we honor you we magnify you and we glorify you Lord God let this not be a license for us to sin but let our lives honor you let us live for you and serve you because we are so grateful for what you did and you first loved us father i pray right now over every single young person that the enemy is trying to rub out of your kingdom and remove from the kingdom of god we pray against that right now i pray that you'd give them a fresh revelation oh god of what your blood did for them at calvary that it covered them every sin, every blemish, every mistake, that we can come to you and we can repent and we can be washed clean. I pray right now, Lord God, that you'd give every young person that revelation that you're not just a king and a creator and all powerful, but you're our friend and you care for us and you feel what we feel. Help us grapple and, re and balance and hold the tension of those two important dynamics, Lord God, that you're not just our king, but you're our friend and you love us and you care for us, Lord. Lord Father, we continue to pray right now for this entire nation, for this COVID-19, Lord God, that you would help stop the spread of this virus, that we would again be able to return into public gatherings and come back into your house and worship with our brothers and our sisters by our side. But until that day comes, Lord, we pray that you'd encourage every young person, encourage every saint of God, encourage every pastor, give them strength and endurance in this time, give them a creative mind as we find ways to reach people with your word, Lord God. I pray right now over this entire nation, over the United Pentecostal Church of Australia, over your work, Lord God, your kingdom. We pray that you, Lord God, bless it. Have your hand upon it, Lord God. Let souls be reached and souls be found. Let people still go in the baptisms, the, the, the baptism of the water, Lord God, and come up fresh and new and clean. Still fill people with the Holy Ghost, even in their lounge room, Lord God. We pray that the kingdom would continue to expand that though the government might shut down our public gatherings your kingdom continues to move forward and I pray that you would bless Lord God and anoint that and have your hand upon the entire work for your glory Lord Jesus we thank you Lord God we, we bless you we magnify you and we glorify you right now in the matchless name of Jesus Christ and every single young person out there said amen